Hi, and welcome to the Imperfect Podcast. My name is Deb Crow, and I will be your host. Join me on this journey as we meet heart-centered leaders from all over the globe. Lots of interesting questions, interesting conversation, and find out what makes a leader. How do they handle uncertainty and complexity? How do they lead in a time that is volatile? Join us. Welcome back to Imperfect, the Heart-Centered Leadership Podcast. As I continue week by week traveling the globe, I am continuously amazed at the talent and the generosity and just the heartfelt traits of the leaders I am meeting across the globe. And it just makes for fun conversation every week. This week, we are traveling back to the United States and I'd like to introduce you to my guest, Becky Haas. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She is known for her contagious enthusiasm. She is a national presenter on trauma-informed care and the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, as well as a pioneer in successfully developing trauma-informed communities. Her season presentation experience includes trips to Delaware presenting to state leadership at the invitation of their first lady, as well as training multiple juvenile justice systems in both Virginia and Tennessee. She developed trauma-informed police training, which is now certified in two states for officer in-service credits, and she's delivered it to the Oklahoma City Police Department, as well as precincts within Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia. Becky is a highly sought out trainer for educators, working directly with school superintendents to impact school districts and beginning their journey to create trauma sensitive schools. So Becky, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Deb. It's my honor to be here. Thank you for the invite. Well, I could spend the half an hour just talking about your experience and accolades, but I thought we would we would best unfold that in some great leadership questions. So here we go. My first leadership question, Becky, is could you explain to our listeners how you felt as a heart-centered leader when you discovered that trauma was really the gateway drug to making an impact and how you really came, I'm going to call it that aha moment, and just what introspection you derived from that. Okay, Deb. Oh, that's one of my favorite questions. Thank you. Well, I was working um, for a police department in Northeast Tennessee when I learned about the ACES study, and my job at the police department at the time was reducing um, drug-related and violent crime in in our community, and um, I really had no criminal justice background when I was hired for that job. I did have background in grant management and community capacity building, uh, but it was in that journey that I heard about trauma-informed care, and one of the programs that I was uh, oversaw the development of in that role was a program probation program for felony offenders with addictions and i began to hear a common reoccurring theme of the adversity many individuals in the justice system have experienced and then when i heard about the aces study that has its scientific evidence that um individuals um, with a you know an adverse childhood without healthy support it's a significant risk factor to addiction and risky behaviors and things that uh, would lead people to the criminal justice system. Um, So as an educator, pretty much all of my career, this content, I mean, for lack of a better term, like punched me in the gut. Uh, I felt like uh, if I wouldn't share this content that I'd be held responsible. Uh, So I, uh, Uh, really kind of like had an epiphany and that's really what's been driving me was how to raise awareness to this study to this science um, to be able to bring new resources to individuals that 
you know, you didn't pick where you start in life. And so many individuals are starting with not the support in their home, but rather the dysfunction. Well, and the other thing that I really love about you taking this leadership role and spearheading and what you've done is the strengthening of relationships that you have really facilitated with heart-centered leadership between police and community and really across culturally diverse populations. And I know that this is just one of many of the things that you're doing with your career. And I know your career has gone in, in many different sectors. So this, this leads very nicely into my next question. Because you've worked across so many sectors in your prestigious career, both developing and implementing educational programs, Becky, what commonality have you observed during your creation process? Well, I saw that when I first started um, to try to bring educational opportunities to different sectors um, around trauma-informed care in 2014 and 15, uh, many sectors, there, were, there was no training that I could find. And as you mentioned, much of my career has been around education. Uh, for many years, I uh, was involved in um, faith-based educational programs, and then I went on to do um, human subject safety and research, education, and then training officers in child passenger safety. So it's always been uh, an education of some kind. So when I came to this topic, um, I really found that there was not a lot of uh, uh, conversation for uh, different sectors, healthcare, uh, maybe a little for educators. Um, so I just did a lot of research to find what were some emerging practices that uh, we could bring to the field in the different areas to help people to see what to do with ACEs science or trauma-informed care. Um, I think that's kind of my niche, uh, Deb, is I'm probably not the one that should lead the discussion on how the neural paths are changed in the brain. Um, I can repeat some of the work of some really amazing scientists, but I think I'm really more a practitioner in this field and where I've sort of gained some notoriety, uh, which amazes me, is helping people see what to do with it. Well, I, I do think you're aligned with that level of uh, expertise and it's like anything else as a, as a leader, Becky, we can have the information, but if we don't know the strategy or the modality of, of how to implement it, then it's basically a book on a shelf. So, so well done to you. Now, I'm very intrigued uh, about the Adverse Childhood Experiences study that was the summer of 2014. Could you explain to the listeners how you felt when you learned about the study? And how do you feel it's contributed to the work that you're doing now as a whole? Okay, uh, good question. Um, well, again, uh, it it impacted me unlike any other education that I that I that I received. I I heard um, Dr. Vincent Folletti at a, a domestic violence conference in San Diego, and he was one of the co uh, the principal investigators of the study in the late 90s. And then just 30 days later, I was at a probation program, um, a re uh, addiction recovery probation program in Florida and heard um, Dr. Joan Galise, who's well known in the States for her work in this topic. And just hearing the two of them back to back, it's like a light came on um, because a lot of my career, uh, Deb, I've been uh, involved with working with juvenile justice program. I just did that as a mom raising two boys. I saw that sometimes families and folks involved with the juvenile system just needed some outside support. And then when I was at the police department, again, I heard and saw the impact that the drug epidemic makes in our communities where we have children born in a home where an addicted caregiver, um, you know, is going off and leaving them alone for two weeks at a time. I mean, I could spend the rest of the day telling you stories I heard of people. And I, and I reasoned to myself, who, 
who, no one picks where they start in life. You know, I could be in another country this morning doing this interview with you. Um, and so that no one picks where they start in life. And, and even though sometimes for unhealthy coping mechanisms, there may be consequences uh, for choosing wrong choices, particularly with addiction and recovery um, and crime around drugs. But yet we need to bring empathy into our services. And so I just started out immediately and some of the folks in the probation program would say in a group, you know, I'm so sorry, that is your story. And so that a part of our process in this treatment now is we want you to be able to access the clinical and counseling where you know, someone can help you to just reconcile that that part of your life was not your fault. And, and that's been a huge driver uh, to me. And, and on the other side of the coin, Deb, it's helped me to see many of the professionals I train um, lost a mother at a young age or lost a child. And what resiliency that we have in individuals that um, have experienced some of these tragedies, um, but yet they had support and, and rose above it. Um, so while I am a champion for the ACEs study, I think the part of it that I'm the biggest champion of it is, is ACEs are not destiny. Your, your adversity as a child, even if you didn't have healthy support, it's never too late that we can come alongside, we can train community partners to come alongside and to help you to, um, you know, overcome that and, and to move forward with a stronger future. Well, I fully agree with you, Becky, and it's interesting as I'm listening to you explain this, a couple things that I want to just reiterate. Our story belongs to us, and we all have our own unique path, and I love the resiliency, especially in working with a population where, as you say, no one picks where they start. And when I was a neurotrauma case manager, I often worked with many individuals, children and adults, who were from different psychosocial and social economic levels. And it never mattered to me because I always just went in with my heart-centered leadership and knew what I could do. And the hardest part for them or for any of us is just starting. And, and without the judgment or looking at circumstance, because again, they did not pick to start from that point. So just a powerful study, and I can see how much that work has really influenced you in your career, in your speaking, and what you're doing. And my last question, Becky, is as a heart-centered leader, what is your hope for all communities? Oh, that's your hitting the questions right on. Uh, some of my favorite things to think about and talk about. Um, really, Deb, my, my hope for every community, and I've been privileged now to begin work with uh, uh, some folks in uh, the UK, and we've got some global uh, conversations going on, and I've already had people reach out to me from Australia, from Africa, um, but really, this is a global message. Uh, but for every nation um, to understand, uh, and I think right now during COVID-19, being in a global pandemic, I think, I think every community has seen maybe um, the empathy if we had a meter like a Geiger counter. I think around COVID-19, I think globally that we've been able for communities and nations to see um, how we are so grateful for our healthcare heroes, our first responders, our teachers who have had to um, quickly, quickly uh, come up with home learning measures, our parents, our families. And, and I think right now there, there, there's a lot of empathy uh, around COVID-19. And, and my hope would be where this natural trauma that we've seen global response to empathetically, that it would make people realize that for many, there's also created trauma. Um, there's the created trauma with domestic violence or intimate relationship violence or children that are abused or neglected, um, as I alluded to before. And so that we wanna keep the measures of empathy 
um, but focus on the fact that sometimes there's this silent suffering and we don't have to know the story, but if we could just go into life and when a shop clerk might seem a little rude, rather than respond with rudeness ourselves, you know, to think there may be a backstory here. They may be, you know, struggling to get a month rent paid or need two tires for their car. And if we could just come at things more empathetically, I, I feel like my role, Deb, is helping to raise awareness. Even though there are clinical needs around complex trauma that people have experienced, but yet I think at the community level for secretaries to realize when they're scheduling appointments or, or, or p people that are doing case management, more of a mentoring type of role, that if we could just come with that lens of not judging, not shaming, because we have no idea what someone has walked in. And again, we don't have to know about those story details, but if we would just bring a new level of kindness and empathy into our services, into our communities, I really think that we're going to see um, a healing uh, begin to take place. And, um, you know, I, I read a wonderful book by some doctors uh, about compassion in healthcare called Compassionomics. And one of the stories was all about um, doctors and research on loneliness and how compassion helped turn situations around and a chapter written about folks that ended their life tragically by suicide. And we know globally suicide numbers are, are so high. But in this chapter, they had access to some letters that were left behind by people who had tragically ended their life. And one letter, they talked about a man who ended his life jumping off of a bridge. And in the letter he left behind, he said, if on the way to the bridge tonight, one person will smile at me, I won't jump. And you know, Deb, I hope if something comes out of this podcast today, you know, I ask people when I train them, what day could you not have brought one smile to somebody if you knew that is something they'd written to a letter on the way to end their life? Well, and that's oh, so powerful. You know, I think, I think there is a global sense of grieving going on with COVID. It's touched all of our lives in some way, shape or form. And bringing those heart-centered leadership traits to all that we do and and people have to realize you don't have to have initials after your name to possess and exercise such qualities like you're talking about compassion and empathy and and especially right now attentive listening and people are just wanting to be seen and heard and valued and validated and loved and if we can just put that perception in our back pocket and and lead with that agape love and just think there must be something going on in their world today it's an easy shift to do becky but it's it's a hard practice for many so maybe today we'll we'll put a little bit of a shift in, in people's thoughts and their habits of thinking to, to be a bit more heart-centered. I, I like to end the, pod, the podcast with what I call my Fab Four. And these are just four fun questions and we'd love to hear what's kind of sitting just at the top of your mind. So my first question, Becky, is what is your favorite self-care activity and why? Oh, that's okay. That's easy to answer. I love to ride my bicycle. I um, live close to a, um, our community um, has a lot of rails to trails, uh, bike and walking tracks and um, where they bought uh, old, uh, you know, railroad uh, accesses that are not used anymore. And um, one is an access point is right near my house. So every morning at seven o'clock, I see the sunset every day that it's pretty enough. I'm out there putting in about 15, 16 miles um, on my bike. And sometimes it's people will say, well, call me and I'll join you. But honestly, Deb, I enjoy the quiet. And, and sometimes I listen to podcasts. I've been listening to yours. Uh, but sometimes I just enjoy the quiet. So riding my bike. Well, and I always say for leadership that a quiet mind is a mind full of clarity. So good for you. Happy to hear that. My second question is, what gives you hope? What gives me hope is 
to see this message that I'm privileged to share, to see from um, governor's wives to hospital CEOs to security officers to school teachers, um, to see the amazing um, empathy and kindness in people's hearts. And I seldom ever do a training or an event where I don't get an email, um, where I get a response of some kind. One of my, and I have a file that I actually save. So when I hear the stories of either how folks themselves have overcome and, and risen up to be resilient over you know, trauma in their own life, but then sometimes to hear some of the things they do for others. Um, I had a newspaper reporter covering one of my trainings when I trained our local homeless services uh, a few years ago, and he wrote a beautiful piece in the paper on kindness is the cure. And later on, a few weeks later, he sent me an email and said, I have to tell you this, and I'll shorten the story, but he was uh, called to cover for the newspaper a uh, someone who was hoarding stuff and there had been a violation by codes because the mess in their property uh, neighbors were bothered by it and such so as he went to talk to this individual um, uh, it ended up the stuff out in the yard belonged to one of their parents and um, they had died recently and they just didn't want to throw it away because that parent had gotten them out of a violent situation with their other parent and so here's this reporter who just heard about trauma and said to this person being interviewed, I'm so sorry, that's your story. And when he reported it in the newspaper like that, you know who helped her to clean up the mess? The very people who had, had complained. And so to me, that, that is my hope. Well, that's a great, great demonstration of a full circle moment, isn't it? Yes. That's amazing. My third question is, what do you want your legacy to be? Wow. You know, I don't think I've ever thought of that. Well, I guess a legacy would be, I think about our two sons that are grown now and married with families of their own. And, and my husband and I'll often talk about maybe what we feel the most proud of as parents and and for us, it's, it's been very rewarding to see both of our sons um, have uh, faith as a center of their life. And now as they have families, that faith is important to them. And, and so I guess as I think about a legacy in a career, um, and I would love to see people take the tools that maybe I helped introduce, and I am already seeing that, a mayor in one town, uh, they've started a workforce development program around this with navigators working in HR of a large factory, um, helping people without blaming or shaming to find resources when they get behind on a light bill or something like that. So I hope, Deb, that if I, you know, crack the door on this topic and help people put some tools in their hands, um, that maybe, you know, down the road, there's going to be some amazing things happen in communities. And maybe I started by shining the light under the door. Oh, I think you've done more than shine the light. I, I think you've, <laughs> you've spearheaded a, a kindness, compassionate highway. And oh. with your multi-sector work, uh, you've definitely made a, a huge imprint. So just kudos to you. My last uh, question for you is, if you had to have a conversation with the younger Becky today, what advice would you give her? I would tell her not to worry. Um, I've spent, you know, many a day, many a night, you know, looping through my head conversations or maybe mistakes that I made. And, you know, the older I get to, the more I see that, like a lot of times things that I gravitated to because of being a heart-centered leader, I didn't really know to call it that uh, until I met you, but um, I, I saw that in the end, when I looked back, that this, this beautiful picture was being painted. 
And at the time, maybe I didn't see that this step was adding color to the forest or, you know, picking the flowers or whatever the picture was made of. But the older I get, the more I see that um, a lot of things that I've gravitated to choose to do in my career around my heart, whether it was helping working with police, working with neighborhoods in that, working with folks struggling with addiction or young people, um, is that I saw that it was leading like a ladder to the next step. And so I would go back and tell younger Becky not to lose sleep at night, that it's all going to work out, and that really there's uh, something in motion here. And just enjoy the journey. Oh, you're speaking my language. I always say <laughs> enjoy the joy in the journey and, and just not having any attachment to the outcomes and enjoying the work. And I think you've done that so beautifully in, in your career and being able to educate and create and develop and implement across multiple sectors. And I'm sure that wasn't at the forefront of your mind when you started. So I just really, really want to thank you for your time and your expertise and, and wish you continued success and lots of bike rides until the snow comes. <laughs> well, thank you, Deb. And thank you again. What an honor to be um, on your show today. And thank you for all that you're doing to make a difference. Well, I like to end the podcast with my list of five things that I believe in my heart help us live a purposeful life. Follow your heart, have passion, do your best, know your truth, and always be in love with the, jo with the journey. This is Deb Crow. Thanks for joining me once again on Imperfect, the Heart-Centered Leadership Podcast.